As a teenager in 2006, I spent several months saving up money to buy an Xbox 360 and even more than Grand Theft Auto 4 or the next gen Madden, there was one game that motivated me to get the console for myself. Capcom's Dead Rising. Nearly 20 years since then, it's been fun to discover that it still holds up as an endearing open world zombie game that undoubtedly has its flaws. In essence, Dead Rising is a darkly comedic take on Romero's Dawn of the Dead. It's focused on a zombie outbreak that begins in a mall in Willamette, Colorado. Photojournalist Frank West, a self-serious investigator whom you can nonetheless dress up in a significant number of absurd costumes, arrives to look into the matter then gets trapped in the mall with dozens of other human survivors. Surrounded by hordes of the undead, whenever he steps out of the safe room, his mission is to determine the cause of the zombie plague, survive the outbreak until rescue arrives, and save as many others as he can. Sometimes this means following a mission marker towards signs of commotion, where Frank might find a survivor or several holed up in the back of a jewelry store or supermarket. Sometimes you'll come upon desperate survivors merely by chance or through exploration. The game won't tell you of their whereabouts in your mission log, but you might hear them crying out while slicing zombies in half with a katana at the faux Starbucks. In any case, Frank will need to escort them back to the safe room, leading to frustration as the NPCs make for unreliable escort missions. They're bad at finding a path through the undead and tend to get grabbed or slashed. Thankfully, you can arm and heal them along the way, but a limited inventory system means you'll often juggle bringing what you need to lead the pack and what the pack needs to follow you toward their salvation. Though the game offers several welcome fixes to be discussed later in this review, the survivability of NPC allies is not among them. As a photojournalist, Frank has covered wars, but in this mall, he's babysitting. Dead Rising's tone is constantly shifting. Some missions play out with the seriousness of a murder charge, while others unfold with spin kicks and cheesy dialogue that would feel at home in a B-movie. My store. <laughs> My... Even the game's photography mechanics, which let you take pics for XP, reward you for taking dramatic and horrific photos, but also comedic pictures too. Ultimately, this blend of tones comes out of the wash as something closer to the absurd. Even when it's hinting its seriousness, Dead Rising is ridiculous, and it's better for it. This is never more evident than it is with the game's many bosses, who are called psychopaths. Each of them is found in different parts of the mall at different times throughout the story, and they tend to personify some element of United States culture that the developers pick on through these overacted caricatures of people, even when the real-life issues may be much more deserving of solemnity. A family of hunters who turn their attention to human targets hits on America's uniquely problematic gun culture. A power-tripping cop takes hostages in a woman's clothing store, abusing the victims in a strange, funhouse mirror reflection of real-life issues. None of these characters say anything meaningful in the end, though it also doesn't feel like the studio has missed its intended mark. They all feel like cartoonish displays of America's worst attributes, and that's all. Any commentary anyone wishes to add to them feels like it's not in the game's text or subtext. One could contribute thousands of words on this design decision and any good or harm it may do, but ultimately it feels like Capcom is merely shitposting, so why bother? I find them neither offensive nor insightful. In some cases, I'm sure they'd be handled differently today, but I mainly just find them loud and silly. <laughs> These NPCs, hidden characters, and bosses combine with the game's universal timer system to make a perfect run of the game, completing all missions, saving all survivors, and killing all bosses, either exciting or maddening, depending on what you're into. For my taste, achieving this is more pain than pleasure, given some of the game's yet-to-be-mentioned flaws. Though here in this remaster, I found I don't mind the timer itself as much as I used to. Essentially, the game is constantly aware of its day-night cycle. Hours don't tick by in real time, but they do tick by at a rate consistent in its world, so you can reliably plan ahead as you carve out routes through the hordes and missions slowly evaporate off your quest log forever 
if you don't complete them in time. Secret shortcuts can be found, and vehicles, as poor as their controls still feel 18 years later, can be driven across the expansive courtyard between more sections. There's ultimately one optimal, rigid path through the 12-hour game that will allow you to make excellent use of your time, so you can see and do everything, and finding it was once a communal effort. Today, these answers are widely available online since the internet optimized all of this nearly 20 years ago. Dead Rising has an uncommon crowdsourcing aspect to it, which makes it a fascinating game despite its faults. You have to know when to look for the survivors you're not warned about. You learn, via comment sections on GameFAQs threads that would be old enough to drive, when you should bring a train of NPCs with you to some other section of the mall to grab an important item for a soon-to-be-needy survivor stashed in your safe room or when to beeline it for the safe room because a powerful trio of bosses roaming in the Humvee will soon spawn in the courtyard, and they'll almost surely run over your allies if you give them the chance. You can learn these things on your own, but you'll probably learn them the hard way. All of this also ties into the game's roguelite element, which is technically optional but likely to be used at least once or twice in any playthrough. Whenever Frank dies, you can elect to reload your last save, will start from the very beginning of the game while keeping his level and skills intact. Early on, Frank is slow, devoid of helpful attack moves, and has little in the way of health or inventory space, making some missions extremely difficult to beat on a single run. It can be done, but your best bet is to reset the story with a sturdier Frank. That's true for a standard run in which you'd like to just beat the game, but especially for those seeking the flawless playthrough. Sometimes, force multiplying these frustrations are its uneven combat systems. On one hand, being left in a mall in which virtually everything is a weapon is such an awesome video game premise. Similarly, you can heal with an impressive number of food items like whole pies and two-foot baguettes, all of which Frank consumes in a few swift, cartoonish gulps a la Scooby-Doo. Many of the game's quirks and even some of its flaws ultimately make Dead Rising special. The world is consistently ridiculous in its sights and sounds, and its gameplay woes often fall by the wayside as a result. That's truer in the deluxe remaster version than ever before, because though the total package of Dead Rising has aged to be a worse game than it was in 2006, this is also clearly, and perhaps paradoxically, the best version of the game. Several quality of life changes have provided the conveniences that the open world genre normally affords players. A compass at the top of the screen now helpfully points you toward the optimal route, even adjusting to reflect optional shortcuts once you've unlocked them. Meters inform you of a weapon's remaining durability, removing the guessing game from the mechanic like the original had. Arguably the most important aspect is the ability to advance time, which allows you to speed up those smaller chunks of time between when you've done all you want to, and when the next main missions unlock in the game's universal timer. My favorite of the game's changes, however, is so simple and yet so welcome. Before, if you didn't go to a restroom to save your game and then you died, you'd lose everything you'd done since your last save. Because saving took you off the path you were on at times, this also ate into your available time. Now the game saves whenever you transition from one section of the world to another, like when you exit the safe room, or move from the North Plaza to the supermarket, keeping you on track and being much less punishing if you failed to save for a while. All of these new elements make the game clearly better than the original version, which I'd say is also true of the visual overhaul. Moving to Capcom's proprietary RE engine, DRDR adopts newer Resident Evil games' touch of sepia tones, which alters the game's overall color palette in a way that may have some video game preservationists up in arms. I don't mind it though, as it's ultimately pretty subtle unless you compare the versions side by side and notice some blue hues swapped for shades of tan. Along with that, the modern conveniences like much better textures and stronger facial animations mean the game looks modern. Clean up! Register 6! <sighs> Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster is a better version of a classic flawed game. Those blemishes are sometimes more glaring today, but some great fixes to the overall package also erase some other issues entirely. Its timeless qualities, like an absurd story and a fun setting, keep it from feeling like an unwelcome retread. 
Still, I'd hope the next Dead Rising fixes a lot of what this one does poorly, and even some of its sequels did that, so it seems likely. In 2024, Dead Rising is no longer the sort of game that would make me run out and buy a new console, but it is a game that I'm happy to revisit in its improved form.